like you don't associate Justin Baldoni and smart. That's just not something that that was not that's not been my experience in my life. Maybe part of that can be because of the way that I look. Maybe my experience has been I've often been classified as somebody who looks a certain way. You know, if you think one of the one I didn't put this in the book, but one of the struggles I had was I put my heart into Jane the Virgin. You're listening to Really Famous with Gara Mayer Robinson. Read a PG-13. This is part two with Justin Baldoni. Get ready. He really opens up in this part. If you haven't caught part one, go ahead and check out this card up here or click on the link that I put in the description below. You will love that too. You will love this one. Let's do it. Were you team Raphael or were you team Michael? Um, well, I would, for my ego, I was team Raphael because... Uh, you know, as a man, as like the actor, you want your character to win, right? To win the girl. Um, I think in life, I think it's tricky because I got to play this guy for five years. And so I understand, I, I know his insecurities and, and, and he's a good man. Yet he was, he's, he's like me, like he, you know, he had, look at his father, he was adopted. He had his mother, you know, it's like the whole thing was just everything. All the social forces against Raphael were so huge that it's a miracle that he ended up as good as he did. And really, if you look at, if you look at why it was because of cancer and ultimately because of Jane, because the women, right? Um, so I got his journey. So as a, as a person who was living in his shoes, I was team Raphael. As an outside observer, I would have been team Michael because I want to reinforce the narrative that the good guy can get the girl, that the good guy can win, right? Now, he also messed up and got jealous and did a lot of bad things. And nobody, you know, all of the heroes were flawed, which is why I think the show was so great. Um, but, yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's, it, was, it was who Jane decided she wanted for herself. So maybe that means I was Team Jane. Well, right. That's so interesting. So I'm going to defend Raphael because he wasn't a bad guy, I'm going to say. And no, he wasn't a bad guy right. at all. He just, right, maybe was not as in touch with himself as Justin Baldoni is becoming. Of course not. And he didn't, because, well, he didn't have a Emily Baldoni or a Jane Gloriana Villanueva in, in his life until right. he did, right? His entire life was about earning his father's love. And that's a very, and, and the only thing, and his father didn't really even love him because it wasn't even his dad. Mm -hmm. You know, he found out later on, but his father only cared about success and money and hotels and he was living in his father's shit. So of course he's going to be that way. Of course he's going to be the way that he was. So it's about, you know, again, you walk a mile in his shoes and suddenly you understand everything. Yeah. You have compassion. So true. So one of the things that was, I think that's why I was bringing up Jaime as well is because one of the things he told me was the reason why it worked so well is because everybody, all the characters were sincere, right? It could have looked silly or, you know, over the top or whatever, but everyone was sincere. Like every per, every character, you love every character. There was no character in there that you didn't except for... Um, What's her, can, it's been a couple of years. What, what, what was her name? The villain. Do you remember? The, the villain? villain? Magda? Uh, Rose? Rose. Rose. Yeah. Sin Rose. Rose. Right. That's right. No, yeah, but you even, liked, you even liked her. You know, Bridget, who played her, was just so charming and so good. You like everybody. And that's, the, that's, that's what they tried to do. And that's what happens also when you, I think, have a women-led show. Right. Is, is you write three-dimensional characters and you have compassion and empathy for all of them. It's Even so good to see the story forward. Yeah, I mean, it's so good to see that because you know that there aren't that many complex women shown on TV. But here in Jane, there were so many. It was it was good for humanity to see all of that. I think. So, yeah. is there going to be a sequel no. of Jane the Virgin? No. <laughs> no. Just flat out no. No, there's not. It was five years. 100 episodes, um, a beautiful experience. It was always going to be four to five years. That was the story arc of the show. I don't know. I, they might call us in a couple years or 10 years and say, hey, you want to do a reunion special or, you know, I don't know. A, maybe maybe the showrunner will come up with an idea for like a six episode or five episode. I don't know. But as of right now, no, it's just it's it. I might have some scoop because this is another thing that Jaime told me in our last interview 
was that Jenny was talking about she wanted to do some sort of a follow-up, not a whole sequel, but maybe like a 10 episode or something like that in the future. What's going on right now? Oh, that's cool. I'd be down. All of us would do it. We'd all watch it too. All right. Well, I hope we could do that. I hope it, I hope, yeah. I, I haven't heard anything about it, but if it happens, if they call me one day, so long as I'm not off shooting a movie or, you know, doing right. something, I'm in. So speaking of which, okay, so was that, I think I looked at your IMDb page. Is that, was that your last acting role? So you've only been directing and writing since then? Yeah, it was two years. We, we wrapped the show. It'll be two years. So I've just been, I've been um, directing and, uh, and writing the book and um, building, building our studio. Right. So fun fact also in mm -hmm. your book is that your wife, Emily, auditioned for Petra, or was going to audition for Petra, the role of Petra. She did audition for Petra. That's so great. Yeah. And I remember reading, I remember reading with her and being like instantly insecure about the way that Raphael was described and being like, oh my God, if she gets this, she's gonna have to work with this guy. Like, who's this guy gonna be? Like, he sounds dreamy. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, of course, that's the joke that life plays on. Right. But that is so interesting, too. And you you were kind of struggling. I think you said you hadn't acted in three years when you got that role. So how did you even uh, get that role? Yeah, two two years, yeah. I um, I was directing. I'd been directing a documentary series called My Last Days where I was traveling the country and telling the stories of people that had a terminal illness but were living amazing lives. Um, and uh, I was directing music videos and commercials. Um, that was, you know, and with the, with the goal of one day, you know, maybe in my forties becoming a feature film director. Right. I've been directing music videos since I was in my early twenties. Uh, so I, she had introduced me to her manager who also represented directors and, uh, we met and I said, Hey, this is, this is what I want to do. This is the kind of stuff I'm directing. I'd love to do TV one day, movies, but for now I'm doing this kind of stuff. And they signed me. And then, and then I said, hey, every once in a while, I'd love to audition as an actor because I miss it. It was a part of my brain that I missed. And like two weeks later, they sent me Jane the Virgin. And I was like, this looks familiar. I feel like I just read with my wife. It turns out they had been looking for Raphael for months and months. And they had screen tested a bunch of guys and chemistry read with Gina and um, Jenny, the showrunner, was just not satisfied because he was, you know, he was the, the male heartbeat of the show. He was the male lead in terms of like the, the, the journey she had in her head for the character, which I wasn't aware of. I had no idea. Um, and it was a very bizarre thing. I went in and like the next day they were like, come screen test. It's you. There was nobody else. I met with Gina. We read, we got along fabulously. We became like, you know, BFFs started talking about God and why we're here and all this stuff. Cause I hadn't acted. I, that was just, a totally different wavelength. And that was it. Out of the, out of the audition room, they're like, "Congratulations!" I was like, "What? I've been acting for I've been acting for ten years, and no one's that's never happened. It's never been that simple." They're like, "No, it's you." And I was like, "Oh, okay." We shot the pilot. Had no idea what it was going to be. Shooting a pilot is still like a lottery. You don't know if it's going to happen. Tons of pilots are shot. Got a phone call. Got picked up. And then we were off. Next thing we know, we're at the Golden Globes. And it's just, you know, five years later, the show ended. And we knew it was, we knew it was, it was not canceled. We knew it was only a five-year show. And how lucky we were to have all five years. So. Yeah. I mean, that is so wild. That sometimes it just happens. You think that's it. And then it's the biggest break. And then it changes everything. And that probably helped launch you into whatever else you really wanted to do on top of acting. Am I right? That kind of. Well, yeah. Cause it, cause my goal wasn't acting. It was, so I had, I had already started a production company when we had, when I was working the show, I was directing, I was producing these documentaries and, um, that was what I was going to do. I wanted to make socially conscious media. I wanted to make stuff that touched people's hearts and made people feel. And when this happened, I was like, okay, well, most of my time is now going to go to the show, but if I can be mindful, if I, if I, if, if this show can help me kind of get in the Hollywood elite, so to speak, or to be, or open doors for me that I 
couldn't get open, then let me use this show uh, mindfully to build the things that I deeply care about that can help make the world a better place. And so every day, every day I was on Jane the Virgin, I was doing three or four other things to make sure that when it, when it ended, I'd be in a position um, to, to, to have the biggest impact. So Jane was the rocket fuel to, uh, to the rocket that I had been building prior to Jane. So and it was very, it was very, um, it was thought out in a lot of ways in terms of making sure that like, okay, great. You know, so I'm on CBS and, you know, uh, five feet apart was a CBS film with Lionsgate. Right. So everything had its, had its place. Um, and it would took Jane the Virgin for anyone to take me seriously. <laughs> right. Isn't that, yeah. It just reminded me of something else that you said in the book about how is it, when you're talking about body image and how you would be feel, well, here's that word again, insecure sometimes when you were filming with your shirt off. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you would share that a little bit on set. And of course, when you said, I really feel, I'm starting to feel nervous or insecure about how I look, I have this scene coming up and they would basically just laugh because what are you talking yeah. about? So that must be hard too. Like when you were writing the book, did you kind of think to yourself, like, did you worry about what are people are going to roll their eyes and be like, you know, you have everything. What do you mean? Well, or is that a weird question? I, I'm not even sure what, what I'm thinking about when I ask you that. I just, that really well, is the, interesting. It was the best format to talk about it because uh, nobody would interrupt me. Nobody would laugh at me. And it's just me writing. So, you know, to be, to, to have the, the able-bodied privilege I have and to have the body that I have that looks the way that it does kind of genetically, it puts me in a, in a, um, a place in life where because of also the social forces and how we're socialized, I'm not allowed to feel a certain way about my body except good. But that's not real. That's not fair, right? And, you know, I can only write about what I know <clears throat> and my experience with my body is that even though it looks good, it doesn't always feel good or that I don't feel good. You know, when you're written into a show and in the script, it says we zoom in on Ma and Raphael's six pack. And yet I don't look in the mirror and feel like my six pack is good enough or defined enough for what the writer might have written. And that creates insecurity. I don't have anyone to share it with because of, because I, you know, because society deems me to have a perfect body. So then what does that do? That just creates more shame and insecurity and you feel like you can't talk to anybody about it. You're not allowed to. And in reality, there's, there's a privilege that I have to have respect for. Um, but at the same time, you know, a lot of people that have really, really great bodies or who spend their time working out and fitness deep down are covering up insecurity. They're masking something. They spend all day in the gym. Something else is going on, dude. Like, what are you not dealing with? And we lose ourselves in that. So you find something that you're getting external validation for, and then you put all your eggs in that basket. But what do we see? We see what happens when it becomes harder and harder. 38, 30, I'm 37 now, it's not as easy. 48, it's going to be twice as hard. 50, well, what do you see? You see men start taking performance enhancing supplements, testosterone, HGH, things that are not necessarily safe. You see, you know, you risking your life to look a certain way so that you can not have to deal with the thing that you were masking anyways. Now, all I have to say, we're also validating men who look a certain way in society. We're telling them that if you have a six pack and wide shoulders, then you are enough, not just for women, but for other men that you're respected, right? We want that. We crave that. We need that. Um, but at the same time, what's underneath it? I was just willing to say, Hey, I don't, I'm not, I don't feel, I don't feel good. I'm a dad. So I was just willing to say and, and acknowledge, hey, I'm struggling here. I don't feel like I look great. I don't, uh, you know, can you give me a, can you give me a heads up when there's going to be a scene where I have to look like this? Because I, I, I don't just naturally walk around with the best six pack in the world. You know, I just had a kid. I'm like working. I'm doing stuff outside of the show. Like I, I can't just work out all day. I'm here 14 hours a day. Um, and that's a real thing. And then, you know, I write about in the book that an article came out. I think it was in GQ titled How We Ruined the Dad Bod. And I was one of the TV characters that ruined the dad bod. So here I was, you know, suffering 
from an image that I'm helping perpetuate. And that's a, it was a very tricky thing. And again, there's, it's a 1% problem. I'm a very unique person that has that issue. However, if I'm feeling it, there are other people that feel it. And I think it's important that we just, again, question everything and make room for, it doesn't matter if you have a perfect body, you should be allowed to feel how you feel as a man. If I'm not allowed to feel something, if you're telling me that I'm not allowed to feel that thing, then you're telling me that my feelings don't matter. So then you're teaching me and training me to not express my feelings because when I do, I'm going to be shamed. That's what we teach boys at seven, eight years old. That's what they learn in school. That's why we, that's, that's why as Bell Hook says, we engage in that psychic act of self mutilation because we don't have a way of processing our emotions or feelings without becoming vulnerable to attack, attack by men and women. So in that specific area of body image, I was just like, yeah, I was suffering because I didn't feel like I was enough, even though I was. And I had nobody to talk to about it because when I would talk about it, people would laugh at me. So interesting. And I think that's like a common experience in the sense that if you have something that looks ideal to other people, then mm. you almost don't have the room to have problems. But that's yeah. totally false. And Again, this is a thing that as a therapist, I totally see that everybody, it doesn't matter if things look perfect, you know, that you're so lucky enough to have this, that, or the other thing, you're still entitled to have your struggles, right? And they may be a lot bigger than other people think they are, but like I get this a lot with actors where people think that, oh, well, you know, what do they have to worry about? They're famous and they've made it to the top or whatever else. Well, no, they're humans. They're humans. And it doesn't yeah. matter if they achieved whatever else. They still have these, uh, you know, insecurities or I almost don't know. I almost ha have not met one person who does not have a ton of self-doubt, even the most confident person. Yeah. But that's also, so there's two things there. One is it's yes and, right? It's yes, they do. They have made it. They, ha they are celebrities. They, they do have a certain type of privilege that most people don't. And that is an important thing to acknowledge sure. in the complaining of something, right? Or in the struggle. Because at the end of the day, yeah, the average person has a much harder life in a lot of ways. Um, and so the privilege that the celebrity has is something that also is, should be acknowledged by the celebrity, but, and, and um, it's important to also make room for the celebrity to be a person, a whole human being. Because otherwise, then we're treating celebrities as objects, things that don't have feelings, which is what we've done historically. Um, and there's no room for their humanity, which is why when a celebrity kills him or herself or overdoses, we're all shocked because we're like, but they're perfect. They had everything. Why would they do that? But you never see what's happening underneath. You never see under what's, you know, the, the iceberg, right? Um, that actually took down the Titanic. You just saw the little piece of it. There's always so much more. Um, and That's so there exactly has right. to be mm -hmm. room for us to be humans, regardless of whether you are a celebrity or just an everyday hardworking man. Because in the same way, you can look at it, the same pressure that, you know, a guy who works a nine to five on an oil rig um, is struggling with the same kind of, the same thing. He's not allowed to feel certain things as the celebrity who's living in his castle, but feeling completely lonely and depressed, but has no one to talk to. Yeah, They're both not allowed to feel the things that they're feeling. Um, and that's where I think humanity comes in. That's where I think seeing people for who they are, not for what they do comes in. But also it's important for everybody to acknowledge whatever intersection of privilege they're living with. And I've learned that from my friends of color. My friends of color, you know, I, I remember learning that, you know, when I first heard a, a trans woman tell me that she had privilege, I was very confused. But then she told me, no, I have pretty privilege because a lot of trans women don't look like me. And I'm like, wow. So there's intersections, there's levels of privilege, there's levels of oppression. They're just things for us all to be aware of. And so long as we are aware of those things, we have to make room for us to be able to share and be our full selves. And that means sharing our humanity. That means sharing our vulnerabilities, our insecurities, right, in the book. So I had to talk about it. I had to talk about being the person that looks as good as, it, as he looks while also feeling like he doesn't. Because when you scroll down your Instagram and your social media and you see all these people that are getting likes and comments and follows because their bodies look the way that they do, my first thought is, 
man, they must feel trapped. I bet they're struggling because they can't post anything else. It's, it's Pavlovian for them. They can only post shirtless pictures of themselves because that's the only thing that gives them their external validation. I wonder if that guy who's posting shirtless pictures and is working out all day long, deep down wants to post his poetry, but can't. That makes me sad. Yeah. For him. Who's right. he talking to about these things? The women that like him, do they like him for him or do they like him for how he looks? That's what I think about when I see some of these guys. Why? Because I've been that guy. I've been trapped. And we're all experiencing our own versions of that. And so long, and, and as soon as we recognize that, we're able to see each other. It's so interesting. So, right. Okay. I'm thinking of a couple of things. One is how you have these get togethers with other guys regularly, where you talk about real things, which I think is really cool and great for everybody. I just want to mention that. You're, mm -hmm. It's in the book. Everybody can read about it. But going Mandate. back, I, it, what? <laughs> Mandates. That's right. Going back to, I feel like you're so perceptive and smart and you know a lot about different things. And I know in the beginning of the book, you talked about like how, you know, am I smart enough? That's one of the things, right? So were you like a very insightful child? Like no. as a kid, you were not insightful. You weren't oh. getting from people, oh, you really are nobody. Your parents even, your sensitive dad and your supportive mom. No. I think I was put in a box as a troublemaker and a, um, and a attention seeker and, uh, someone who, who very much struggled with, um, with focus. So I, I was a bad student. I was constantly being called in for parent teacher conferences. I barely, barely passed, uh, uh, algebra two which I took twice. Um, I was not a good test taker. I got a 980 on my SATs both times. The second time I, I just filled in C half the time, right? All of the above or D, whatever one that was. Uh, I just, I wasn't a good student. And mostly I think because I didn't feel seen. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel like I fit into the, to the, to the system. Um, and I don't think it was until I was in my, 20s that I felt comfortable to start even expressing my observations. Yeah, but I'm not talking about student because I know what you wrote in the book about the all the trouble you had as a student, but that doesn't mean you're not smart. Like a lot of kids who don't do well I in was school. Never smart. I was never even when you said a second ago, you're so smart. My first thought was like, nah, because I was never called smart. It was not something that I, like you don't associate Justin Baldoni and smart. It's just not something that that was not that's not been my experience in my life. Maybe part of that can be because of the way that I look. Maybe my experience has been I've often been classified as somebody who looks a certain way. You know, if you th one of the one I didn't put this in the book, but one of the struggles I had was I put my heart into Jane the Virgin, but the weeks that would go by, and that everyone on the show got praised as actors, and I was praised for my physique. I was praised for the way that I looked. I was. I was sexualized. I was objectified. I was praised for the tightness of my clothes and, you know, the the gifs that were being made about me. I was never prayed for my uh, praised for my performance. So even in that, I found myself struggling with like, oh, so am I just the guy that sets up all these other great actors? You know, so I was like, am I even a good actor? I would have all these doubts and questions as I would go on in the weeks because they'd keep getting written up and Gina would get read up and Yaya would get, and everyone was talking about everybody except me. I was the guy who talked about my looks. So I think that especially for men in society and women, my God, women have this far worse than men do. We get put in boxes. Mm -hmm. the, the, the hot guy is very rarely smart. What's ironic is that I wasn't the hot guy until I got, was in my 20s. I just wasn't. I, everything grew out of proportion. It just was the way that it was. I was gangly and skinny and like I had braces and I was a junior. Um, I, you know, the big eyebrows, like it wasn't, it wasn't what it seems. So I had a big personality. I would overcompensate. I was the cocky guy, but I wasn't the smart guy. And then, and then, uh, and no, I don't think people, 
I think I think your I think intelligence is generally tied to being book smart. It's tied to the quotes that you can recite. It's tied to the books that you read. It's tied to how you how you speak and the words and the big words that we use. And as we try to, you know, there's even, you know, and especially in the in the intellectual community, there's a way of there's a way of uh, peacocking, even there, where you're, you know, you have a way of leading with certain things because you want people to know how smart. I mean, that's what the world we're living in. So I've just always been in the middle of like everything. So the answer to answer your question is no. Okay, no. so th I definitely have things to say about that because I see everything that you're saying and it's so interesting, but I can tell you, you're smart because there's oh, a, you. in this conversation where- You're having... sweetheart. <laughs> she said, I'm smart, baby. She said, congratulations. <laughs> No, you can go about the rest of your day. But for real, I'm t I don't just throw that out. I don't just give that out to anybody. But what we're talking about and the things that you come back with and think about, you're very sharp. So that's intelligence. So it doesn't matter how you do or if school, that in the box thing is works for you or not. It's not a... It's not always a reflection. It can be, but it's not the only type of reflection on how smart you are. I I appreciate that. And I feel it in, I, my parents do feel that way about me, but the world has taught me something different. And so right. that's, that's just, that's just my experience. But that's also why I wrote the book for myself was because I was yeah. like, I, but the fact that you can observe all these things and then um, take that information and do things with it, draw conclusions about things or make associations with things like certain things that I'm not thinking of anything specific, but a few different times in our talk, I talked about something and then suddenly you were like, oh, yeah, and then, so it's, yeah, and, right, yes, and, but you were able to connect it to something else that's very, that somebody who's not intelligent doesn't well, have I, that ability. I, I, I appreciate it very much. Now, you Thanks. need to start reflecting on that a little bit more. I, and I, I absolutely will. I absolutely will. Because <laughs> I do see it for sure. Um, okay, so are we good? Did we talk about everything you want to promote? Did we talk about your new project? No, we didn't talk about your new project. So um, do you want to tell me what you're working on now? So I saw you have a movie in the works, right? Yeah, yeah, we have. Um, we so my my I started a I started a studio. So we finance and make movies and TV shows. And um, I have a, a movie I'm attached to direct and um, the movies we're producing, which is exciting. But um, but yeah, we're starting, uh, and we're also starting. Um, I don't know when is this going to air. So probably at the end of April, because your oh, reps yeah, would so like the, us to. Yeah, so I'm shooting yeah. right now. So the with a uh, we're shooting the the man in a podcast right now, which is really exciting. So we're having conversations. These are fun, uncomfortable conversations with myself and one of my best friends, Jamie, who I write about in the book, but specifically in the privileged enough chapter. Um, um, and um, and Liz Plank, who wrote for the love of men. So we have this podcast where. Um, I brought them together and we talked to some famous folks about this stuff and, um, and get uncomfortable because, you know, not everybody will agree. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool show. It's a pretty, it's a pretty cool thing. So I feel like after you talk about this stuff again and again and again, and you've written about it. So you spent a lot of time, I'm sure, not just writing it, but editing it and re-editing it, right? So do you feel like it's still as difficult and emotional for you when you talk about it? Or is it does it have a little bit less gravity for no, you no. In, inside? No, it's more. I mean, the more I I keep I keep having to reread my book to remember half the stuff I wrote, but also to um, and read other people's books. And because I, because it's you, you, a book doesn't like every, a book doesn't do it. I mean, this is the beginning. Yeah. Just the, it says the beginning of the journey. And so I read my book kind of like my own journal sometimes to remind myself of like, Oh, okay. That's what I was feeling. That's what I was doing. And then I go back and I learn and I have these conversations and, um, and it's not, it doesn't lose its gravity because it's a, it's a serious social issue. <laughs> It's not like, oh, I'm going to move on to my next thing. I mean. But not the issue itself, just just your how you feel, how difficult it is or like the turmoil that you feel. It's not about it's the biggest struggle I have with it is. Am I going to do it justice? Because I'm a much better writer than a, than a speaker off the cuff. 
And so, cause I, you know, I'm an automatic writer. I can just, so when I sit down to write, like it just shit comes out and half, you know, a lot of the book, I was like, oh, I didn't even know I felt this way. Um, you know, I had kind of, some of the book is me observing in real time things um, about myself, about, you know, there's a whole, I remember writing a whole chapter or a whole section on, on protection and what it means for men to want to be able to protect a woman. And I remember like finishing this whole section and being like, oh my God, I never thought of that. Like that was I, so interesting. Um, yeah. So and so so yeah. So that I, so I just want to do it justice, and that's the thing. I don't have a hard time talking about the things I write about in the book, or my insecurities, or my flaws, or or being vulnerable in that way, because I'm because the reason I'm doing it isn't for adulation or praise. It's to model it so that other men feel comfortable doing it. I have. I mean, it's so funny when my TED talk came out, I saw so many. I mean. Again, I remember the, the two minute Facebook clip was shared like so many times that had 50 million views in two days. And it was just thousands of men just like, just ripping on me. And I remember over and over again, guys were being like, he's just trying to get pussy or whatever they would say. And I'm like, you were, I'm married. <laughs> you know, the comedian would then say, I don't get any, but that's not true. Uh, but I'm like, I'm married. Right. That's not, it's right. the last thing that I'm trying to do here. Right. Um, this is just real, but that's what we do is we put these people in boxes. We put men in boxes and we, we judge their intentions. And, and I just want men to, to just see that like, it doesn't make you less of a man to share this stuff. And if I share it and a man, five men, a thousand men resonate with something, a chapter an experience, then that means they feel seen and then they're going to feel comfortable sharing that thing with another man. If we're constantly in silos and not sharing anything, then all of us think we're the only ones experiencing it. That's the thing. I think that really is the thing, that it's such a common experience that to feel these feelings and these complexities, but have no idea. Think you're the only one because you're not allowed to talk about it. You're not allowed to share about it. So I think that's your, that's, you know, you're gonna have a big impact on that. And it's, it's really a worthwhile mission. If people read it. <laughs> if what? I said, if people read it. People will read it. People will read it. I'm sure of it. So um, are you, I just read that you're moving to Ojai or did I see that you're moving to Ojai? Is that your new oh, yeah, step? Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, you're in Ojai. How is that? It's heaven. It's heaven. We live we live uh, in the country in Ohio, so we don't live in the town. And it's it's amazing. I'm looking out over the Topa Topa mountain ranges right now that are filled with snow because it rained last night. And it's gorgeous. It's green and surrounded by nature. It's so you're really, you're really finding yourself as you evolve and mature in your life. At 37, I'm starting to find myself. That's young. Okay. That's young. It is. Okay. to. Come on, you know, I know you need to know that. You would know that most, I don't know if I want to say most, but many, many people, number one, never find themselves. True. And number two, if they do, it's later in life, after they've had yeah. time to reflect and explore. I'm very grateful that I got married at 29, you know, and, and, uh, and I've had a family and you know, experience some success at a, at a fairly early age, because yeah, um, I'm grateful that it's happening now, but it doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm finding myself, but I'm sure I'm going to refine myself at 45 and 55 and 65. You know, that's how it should be. You need to keep, you know, people, I think all of us, it's, it's good for all of us to keep evolving, to keep finding ourselves, keep understanding ourselves better. And like we said before, other people benefit from that, not just us. Yeah, that's the goal. That's a good thing. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna end with my favorite question. Okay. Which has two parts. Okay. Okay, and then we'll wrap up and I'll just ask you to do a little testimonial afterwards. So, okay, number one is what do people think of you? Like, I'm gonna rephrase that. What's the image that you think people have of you? Divine people. I think there's a lot of different images of me. I don't know. Why don't know. you tell me what the different ones are? I think there are I think there are some people that think it's all bullshit that look at me and be like, oh, he's just, you know, just profiting off of vulnerability or, or doing good in the world or, you know, whatever. 
Um, I think there are people that look at me and are confused <laughs> of why uh, why someone who who maybe looks the way that I do or has what I have uh, is going against it so much and willing to talk about things the way that I talk about things. I think there are people that look at me and go, how the fuck does he do everything that he's doing? Excuse my language. Like, where does he have time? How's that possible? I think there are people that look at me and, <clears throat> and say, oh, he's really sincere and pure and he makes me happy. I, uh, I, don't, I don't know. It depends on who the people are. And I think there's a lot of people by men, I mean men, who look at me and they go, oh, you know, what a, whatever they say cuck boy or all the, you know, beta, what are all the things that they say? I think I'm something different to anybody and everybody. Um, I hope, I don't know if this is going to be the second part of your question. What I hope people look at me as um, is, uh, is somebody who is doing his best to live as sincerely and authenticity and authentically as he can with the platform um, and show the human parts of me, the human parts of life, and help people realize um, that none of us have it figured out, that none of us get out of this life alive, and that who we are as we are is enough. We don't have to be more than we are. Um, and I hope that I can model that. I hope I can model what it's like to mess up and get back on your feet and what it's like to have a marriage and kids and, and work your ass off and then still feel like you're not doing enough. I think I just want to model what it means to be a human and have a, and have a small platform. So, okay, that was close. My the second part was, who are you really? So not how you hope people see you, but who you really are, because this is really famous, of course. Yeah. So what I would say is actually, they're the same. So what I project what I want people to see is, is who I really am. So, um, so I, I don't want to project something that I'm not ever. Mm -hmm. So what I just said, I want people to know and see is my truth is who I really am, which is a guy trying to figure it out. A guy who's married, who's trying to become the best version of himself, a guy trying to show up for his kids, but feels like he always doesn't. And somebody trying to navigate the complexities of what it means to be a public person, um, in a private world and, uh, and, and be true to myself who I really am is a Baha'i. I'm somebody who loves my faith, who loves God, who knows we're only here for a short time and really wants to be of service with the time that he has. Okay, you said three things that I need to follow up with because they're all interesting. So number one, t can you tell me a little bit more about your faith, like how it you're finding yourself now? And that's part of it, I think, right? That probably has a, a lot to do with it. Yeah, look, my faith is really, the Baha'i faith, we believe in the unity of all the religions. We're all different chapters. All the religions are different chapters in one book. Um, it's something called progressive revelation. The idea that there's one God. It's not a guy in the sky with a beard. It's not a man, not a woman. It's not a, a person. It's a it's an entity. That, uh, we, the idea that we cannot fathom as finite beings the infinite. We can't fathom a world with no time and space. We can't fathom something that can create the universe. We can't even picture the universe. The universe never ends. And the Baha'i faith um, believes that all the religions are one at its core that God for the beginning of time before recorded history has sent down messengers and teachers to help get the world, humanity, mankind closer to unity. And that the purpose of life is to develop all of the spiritual attributes of God, all of the things that, that we, without knowing it every day, we're developing the things that we're developing when we get tested, when we get frustrated, when we get angry, when we get hurt, patience, love, kindness, compassion, empathy, right? Uh, ironically, things that women are a little bit better at than men. Uh, and, um, and the reason why we need to develop those things is because one day we're gonna die of this world and be born into a new world where we don't need our bodies. And in place of our bodies, we're gonna have our virtues. We're gonna have the things that we spent this time developing. So it's about being of service, it's about being kind and loving and compassionate it's about always being mindful of who you are. It's about keeping your feet on the ground and, and um, you know, treating people the way you want to be treated and even more so. Um, oftentimes treating people better than you want to be treated. It's about creating a just and equitable world, getting rid of racism and sexism and all of the isms. Um, and, uh, 
And, and then when there is something you're not in alignment with, or when you don't, when you disagree with someone or when someone has a different lifestyle choice than yours, it's being overly kind to them and also um, making sure that they are loved and that you never gossip or backbite about them. Because the worst thing you could ever do in the Baha'i faith is talk poorly about another human being. Because the core, the core, the cause, the reason is unity. That's why it exists. And for us to ever achieve unity in our lives, ever achieve unity in the world, it has to start in our own homes. It cannot spread unless it starts here in the mirror in our own homes. So that's the, that's the faith. That's what I believe in. And um, yeah. Well, that's all good. I mean, you can't argue with any of that. You know what I mean? It's just all yes. Yes to all of that. Um, okay. The other two things, number one, is you said something about parenting, just trying to do the best you can, always feeling like you're not. Okay. I heard something once. Perfect. If you ever want to feel like, a, actually, yeah. Okay. I'm not going to say, I, I, I just said it once off the top of my head and I've repeated it a million times. It's true. If you ever want to feel like a failure, be a parent doesn't matter what you do. You can feel like so good about certain things you do. You're always going to feel like a failure. It's just how it is. Yep. Okay. And then the last thing is fame. I didn't ask you about fame. Like, what is it like for you generally being famous, being recognized? People see you probably and they'll know you right away. How is that experience? It's the opposite of the experience I had growing up because people would talk about you. People would talk about me growing up, but they talk about me in a negative way. Oh, he's this or he's that, or that's that kid over there. So, you know, growing up and having fame is interesting. I want to make sure what the way I look at it is this. If I can make somebody's day with a minute of my day, if I can make somebody's month or a year by taking a minute of my day, then that's something that I'm going to always try to do. So I don't have the type of, there's different levels of fame. I don't have the type of fame where like people chase me down the street anywhere I go. I'm not Sean Mendez or Harry Styles or George Clooney, but the people that follow me or that care about me, I mean something to them. And so I, I value that and I appreciate that. And so I always will try to make time for them. There might be a point in my life or someone else's life where that becomes unmanageable and you have to take time for yourself. But I look at fame as a gift in, in that it has given me so much and the only way I can ever feel good about having it is if I give more. Um, so I try to give more than I take. So I'm always giving, I'm giving it away. It's what we're told in the Baha'i faith we should do. We should give ourselves away. And I try to use my fame to, to create other fame, to highlight things that are important to me, to, to make somebody feel better, to, to make somebody feel seen. Um, and also the thing about fame is that I know it's temporary, so I don't get attached to it. And that's the other very, very important thing is one day the fame will disappear and the virgin will be a memory in someone's mind. And if I don't take another acting job, I'll just be a person behind the scenes that was once that guy and that goes away. So, you know, Baha'u'llah in the Baha'i faith says that wealth is followed by poverty <laughs> and poverty is followed by wealth. And I have no qualms about the understanding that this is a temporary thing. Now I have to trick myself into making sure that I don't try to chase it or to keep it. That's the, that's the key. And that's where that creates anxiety. And that's what creates that, you know, you get stuck in that loop. So long as you have fame and you're comfortable with it going away, then I think you'll be fine. Uh, but if okay. you try to keep it, if you try to hold on to it, you suffocate it. Right. Okay. So that's more of you reflecting, observing, thinking about things, philosophies, analyzing them in your head and doing something with them. Trying. Intelligence. Sorry, I had to say it. I'll take it. I honor that. Thank you. I am smart enough. That was part two, but there's also a big part one. You will love that too. Just tap on this card up here or click on the link that I put in the description below. I'm Kara. This is Really Famous, where you really get to know your favorite celebrities on another level because I was a therapist. So if you have a comment about today's show, please drop it below. I do read the comments. Don't forget to smash the like button and tap on subscribe so you get all my celebrity interviews.